Hello and welcome to News Click. The recent developments have taken the scientific community by storm as the first genetically modified babies were announced by a Chinese scientist, Hu Zhuang Ke. So uh, we have with us today Prabir Purkayasa, News Click's editor in chief, to discuss what this could mean for the future of humanity. So Prabir, questions have been raised over ethics, over if consent was taken properly, and also over if the procedure was itself performed properly. But what do you feel? Are we ready for this? Is this is CRISPR developed enough for this tech, for this sort of procedures to be carried out with humans? You know, the first issue is really understanding what has been done and why this furor. Uh, what has been done is something which till now has been considered off limits, which is that you don't carry out a genetic modification which is inheritable. Hmm. It, if you do do gene therapy, you do it to correct genetic diseases you may carry, the disease load you have, and it still only affects you, not future generations. So this is in effect a germline modification, as it is being called, which means it's something which will be inherited by future generations as well. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, it's introducing an irreversible change into the human population and therefore the pushback or therefore the criticism that has come. Now, why have we not thought of applying a uh, germline modification in terms of gene therapies? So the argument is that we still do not know what are the unintended possible effects yeah. that can take, take place by any modification we carry out at any location. There are unintended consequences. That means it will not just be limited to that location. It could happen elsewhere as well. There could be unintended consequences of editing a gene. And we do not know what the full expression of that really means. It could have other consequences which we are not aware of. So there's, there is, apart from the ethical issues, there are also technical issues involved that is it something which is at the moment ready for introducing this kind of irreversible, irreversible changes. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I think we have to accept that it is, it is going to come up increasingly mm -hmm. that there are parents, if a particular treatment is available, who will, who will say, why should not our babies uh, have inherit uh, these traits which we can now genetically induce mm -hmm. through modifications. So this is a question that we will have to more and more confront. But that's not what we are confronting right now. Right now we are confronting the issue that we have not agreed, the community as a whole had agreed not to do germline modifications. It was also agreed that this is something which will be followed as a guideline. So essentially the geneticist in question, the Ch Chinese uh, scientist, He, has in that sense violated what was the consensus of the scientific community. So I think that's the, that's the other major issue, that irrespective of whether this was possible, was it good, was it bad, all of these aside, also it remains that this was a consensus which was reached three years back and there was a moratorium on introducing such changes, which was voluntarily accepted by the scientific community. And this ability of the scientific community to discipline itself mm -hmm. has actually been put at danger. So the risks are really twofold at the moment, that will we see such a pushback that the entire, entire field of genetic modifications, particularly human genetic modifications, could be harmed. And also, are we likely to see a pushback in terms of, therefore, laws, which will be yes or no kind of laws, and therefore may leave very little room for maneuver in terms of what is a scientific advance that needs to be pursued as against something which is not really desirable at this stage of knowledge. Lastly, I think in a philosophical sense, we have to confront the issue of what is increasingly be called designer babies. But mm -hmm. that's not the debate at the moment. And talking about the experiment itself, what the scientists did, he wanted to make the babies resistant to HIV by, uh, the, he targeted the CCR5 genome. CCR5 gene, yeah. So can you explain what exactly was done, what he tried to do and how successful he could be? Well, the argument is the CCR5 gene 
allows a certain pathway for infection of the HIV uh, the, uh, AIDS virus. So therefore, if you uh, deactivate this uh, CCR5 gene, then you stop the pathway, a possible pathway for infection. Now here the issue is really twofold. One is that yes, it is known there is a particular mutation of the CCR5 gene, which then uh, could could effectively stop this, uh, in fact, this infection pathway from taking place, got being blocked. But the point is what he has done is not that mutation. Mm -hmm. So question is, do, have we seen this particular mutation is introduced and do we know what are the possible consequences of this? This is, the, this is in fact the scientific question that has been raised. The other issue that has been raised is that HIV is a treatable disease today. Yes, of course, it is not something we can cure, but we can treat, control, and people can live normal, live normal lives. So that's the other reason why this was not, in that sense, a life-threatening condition needing a genetic intervention. Mm -hmm. And the third is, even if you think it is that you don't want this to happen, mm -hmm. then it is, and you, the child could get infected with the HIV virus, which the father had. Father was an HIV patient. Then the question is, of course, that you can strain the semen in a way that non-infected uh, sperm really is then available for insemination. Therefore, there are other ways of also addressing the problem. So the key issue which the scientific guideline had said that when we talk about doing this kind of experiments, if you will, it has to be, there has to be something which can't be fixed otherwise. So even a gene therapy uh, or a genetic modification should be only thought of only when there is no other possible method of addressing the problem. And this was certainly not such a case. So even scientifically, this perhaps was not really the appropriate uh, one that we should have targeted. There are far more serious conditions, which if you want to target would be the natural targets. Uh, leaving aside whether it's ethical or otherwise to introduce, as we said, germline changes the state of knowledge, with the state of tools we have. The essential argument here is also that this was something which was not necessary to do. Mm -hmm. And of course, the way it has been done is the second set of questions that comes up. And moving on to the regulation bit, which you raised earlier also, that the scientific community had reached a consensus that we are not ready for this yet. So this does put regulation, self-regulation, which scientists do in question whether it's really effective or not. So what do you feel is the future of this regulation? Because if this scientist could perform this kind of experiment, it does mean that there is a possibility that other scientists can do this sort of tinkering at way more dangerous levels. Well, I think this is really a issue that we have to increasingly face, that CRISPR Cas9 tools have made genetic modifications much easier. Mm -hmm. Therefore, shall we say rogue scientists and rogue laboratories uh, doing this is something which, is, which can happen. It does not require a huge scientific apparatus or a, a machinery or a large, num a large team to do this. Mm -hmm. And that I think the, the scaling down of the technology itself raises question therefore the possibility of uh, people violating what would be a consensus. So I do think that the scientific establishment, in this case the Chinese scientific establishment, will have to take steps. His institute has taken steps. The Chinese government and the scientific establishment is taking steps on this. So we'll have to see how it happens. So I think it is true that self-regulation when technology can be scaled down to a small level becomes increasingly more difficult. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we have a choice because I don't think policing science is an easy task either because the ability of using a hammer uh, is on such experiments would also take away the areas of grace. And if you take the Hong Kong meat, which was uh, really held by uh, the US Academy, the UK Academy and the Chinese Academy of Sciences, I mean the basic genetic bodies who uh, held this uh, conference where this was announced, that that conference came out with a statement which also says the translation pathways should be available, which shorn of all the English, what it really means, there should be also be, there should be, we should allow experiments to take place which can then later 
if we have enough evidence, if we have enough control, if we have enough knowledge, and we have set the right protocols, then can be translated into practice. But what that practice should be, what the guidelines should be, and which are the cases needs the regulatory system to monitor so that it doesn't happen in a rogue or a wild way. So like now that like, you know that this has been done, this technology has moved forward even without the consent of the community. What could this mean for the future? Well, I think much stronger protocols, any of these cases that are undertaken. His case was also that it was that we don't know what the consent was, we do not know what kind of changes did actually take place. He has introduced some uh, slides in the conference that show something, but there is really no evaluation before and after, which would indicate what exactly has been done. So weak protocols is also damaging to science. So I think those need to be also strengthened. So they're done under control conditions. There is an objective assessment of what has been done. And those researchers who are doing it, take the responsibility if the experiment goes wrong in some way, that they bear the responsibility in terms also, don't forget, it's a lifetime support in that case you might have to provide to the twins. There's a third baby also the way we are told. So these are the, some of the issues which need to be really, uh, shall we say, put in place. And these things need to be addressed before we let any of this translatable uh, shall we say, technology development to take place. I think that's one thing which is very clear. But you know, in a larger way, uh, it is true, the genie or the gene is out of the bottle, that yes, increasingly we are going to con control over this technology. And we'll have to address the fundamental question, is it going to be done for controlling disease, irreparable, uh, shall we say, problems that may take place and therefore correct them before birth? Or is it going to be market driven and those who can buy are then going to buy designer babies? This, is in a, this has been an issue that has been raised uh, in the past. And we always thought this is something that we can push much, uh, much more in the future, that this is not something which is imminent. But with the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 tools, and its improvements, I'm not so sure that it is in the distant future, but it does seem that it could come much closer. And therefore, we'll have to address the fundamental ethical question. Is the next generation of, shall we say, uh, the next generation of babies is going to be genetically engineered with money and social power being the determinant? Are we going to breed inequality into the biology of the human race. Mm. And in that sense, uh, as Satyajit in one of the discussions here had said, that theoretically it's possible to consider that you actually breed, quote unquote, the caste system mm. into genetics, okay? Mm. And that's, that is not socially going to be determined, but it could also, be, it may be possible to breed this into the future of the human population, that you breed a docile set of workers, much like the bee population as it were. Mm -hmm. And do we then con confront the ultimate inequality of, the, of that is being constructed, that it is not just going to be social, but you are also going to breed into the human population genetic inequality. I think these are some of the questions we need to confront. And it is not just as I said in the distant future, that these are increasingly questions we'll have to address here and now. Thank you, Prabir, for joining us today, and thank you for watching NewsClick.